Hey expats and travelers, it's Kaylee here from Expats Everywhere. And about a month ago, we had an interview with Carl about Portugal. Well, today I'm going to sit down with his wife, Luisa, who was watching the interview and was like, you missed so many different things. So today we'll talk about all the little dirty things about Portugal that Carl missed. Let's go. So Luisa, let's start off with, why were you slagging him off? What happened? <laughs> well, um, Carl put on your show, um, the one that he did with you, and um, I, was, I was watching it. I was really enjoying it, and I kept thinking, why hasn't he mentioned this? And I started writing a list of all the things he missed out. And I was just, I, I, this really long list, and was so surprised, and I just popped it in an email and said to Carl, send that to the guys, send that to them, because you need to do another show. Because um, it's really easy to give a kind of idea that Portugal is all good. And trust me, it's, it's a great place, but there's also some things to bear in mind, you know, especially if you want to stay here in the winter or something like that. So I just thought it was the mum in me or, you know, the woman, you know, like we care about details a bit more maybe, but yes, yeah, I exactly. Gave, I gave him a ton of grief for that. <laughs> Which is funny because we did indeed get that list and it, it, right away Josh and I are like, we need to interview Louisa now because there are all these things that, I mean, Carl's interview was long, but there's just a lot that you can unpack about Portugal and there's, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the ugly, I guess you could say, some stuff that Carl apparently missed. So let's jump right in with the first one. I think that a lot of people think of Portugal and they think of sun all year round or there's some stat that says like 330 days of sun or something like that. Now, for those of us who don't live in the Algarve or don't live on one of the islands, what is the weather really like? Well, it gets cold. We've been here three, coming up four years and each year we've had approximately seven, possibly eight months of really nice times. I, I really in particular like March and April time and May and then I really, really love September, October, November. But halfway through November, it seems that it just starts to get cold. And it also starts to get very, very damp. Now, it's not the same temperature as, as it is in the UK. So, for instance, the UK will go down to a couple of degrees. It doesn't get that cold in the UK, but the houses here um, are, are very different in the way they're constructed. And so the winters feel very, very cold if you haven't got your heating right in Portugal. And um, if you think about it, like... Uh, I don't know what it's like where you're from, Kaylee, but like places where we grew up, we only had to deal with a temperature difference of, say, 25 degrees, you know, but here we have to be able to live in a possible 40 degree difference of temperature. And that makes a huge difference. You know, so it gets really hot in the summer and it does get really cold in the winter. And in the winter, it's actually often warmer to be outside of your house than it is to be inside your house. Yes, we've definitely experienced that. And it seemed like a pretty cold winter this past winter as well. And a lot of people were complaining about the heating in their homes. So I think, like you said, it, it depends a lot on how the heating is within your home. So tell us a little bit about the differences of, of types of heatings and what do you think is the best and what you would recommend? Well, I'd recommend two things. Um, the first thing is to get the damp under control. So um, we've lived in quite a few places. And we've moved around quite a bit through Portugal. Um, and we've lived in old houses, traditional houses, a brand new condominium type thing. Um, and we're living in an old farmhouse now in a converted flat. The condo was great <laughs> because it had underfloor heating, which was perfect. Um, it had really big windows, so it would trap the sun when you wanted it. The houses over here are built to keep the, the heat out, not to keep the heat in, which is different. Um, obviously, in the UK, we, we build our houses to keep the heat in. But here, they, they build them to keep the, the heat out. And they also don't seem to put in much to do with airflow. Hmm. So, so we have air bricks in the UK in little vents in all our walls. You don't see those so much here. Um, in fact, I don't think I've seen a single one in all the different houses we've been in. There's no air vents. And so the walls get really damp. The internal walls often feel damp. Where, where we lived in one house where they have stone floors, um, I think they're built right onto the ground. And in the winter, when it, it rained for about a week or two solidly, our floors started to get wet. So oh, my gosh. stone floors, these were ceramic ones, they started um, absorbing the underground water um, as, as the water table rose. And so our floors were wet. At first of all, they just felt a bit sticky. You know, as you're just like walking around, you're just thinking, why is my foot? And, and then <laughs> by so many Portuguese people, 
have um, or locals that live in a kind of local way not we're not talking like living in a city at the moment we're talking about living in the country which i do recommend doing because you get to see a bit more of portugal but people have um throw down rugs and they put them all over their their ground floors and i think it's to keep their feet dry when the um when the tiles get wet but what does that do to the rugs don't they get wet yeah, you have to chuck them in the wash. We were just washing over and over and over. And then you then you think, well, where am I going to dry my things? Because if you dry the stuff in your house and there's no airflow, your house gets even more damp. Yeah. It gets dry, but the walls get damp. So it's, it's a continuous thing. Um, I noticed when we were living near Lisbon that during the day, especially in the winter, people were opening their windows and putting their duvets out over their balconies. And I just thought, oh, that's really sweet. That must be a traditional thing. <laughs> I realize now that if you don't do that, your bedding gets wet. And um, where we've got um, a bed that's really low on the floor, we actually lift our mat. We don't have to do it now because it stopped raining, but it was raining for about three months where we're living. If we weren't putting our mattress up every day um, to kind of dry it out, then the, the damp just gets into your bedding and, and your mattresses. So if you're living in an old traditional house, you have to, I think, have a dehumidifier. That's essential. Like we were running one for about three or four hours every day for the last two months and pulling out two liters of water from the air. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> if we hadn't pulled that out, that would have just been absorbed by our clothes and our bedding. Now, do you uh, think that newer places need this as well? Not so much, but I have been in quite a few Airbnbs. So mm -hmm. like we use Airbnb a lot. And um, Airb Airbnbs often have like any cupboards that don't get any airflow, they go moldy. So um, where we've um, stayed in places, we've seen lots of those little um, dehumidifying kits, you know, those little ones with um, silicon in and, and they literally just sit in your cupboard and they suck out the, the damp. Right. So I recommend it like if you're buying a place, if you're staying in a place for six months or so, get some of those little kits and put them in your wardrobes because your clothes will start to go damp, especially in the winter, just because they have such a, a huge temperature shift and nowhere for the damp to go. Right. And then you see mold. Yes. You yeah. Do. Um, yeah. So the other big, the other big thing we did is um, we have um, a spray bottle that we just put neat white vinegar in. We often uh, spray around the windows, um, around the tops of the walls where mold forms, around the door frames and things like that. And the moment we start seeing mold, that's it. We get the vinegar spray out. Uh, I would test it if you're going to do it on your sofas, but we haven't had any problems with, um, you know, using vinegar. It works. It clears it up really quickly. Okay. That's good advice. So that's probably for maybe like three or four months of the year that it's this cold, rainy that you need to be aware of. And the rest is more of that, oh, sunny Portugal, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing um, is it does get really, really hot and <laughs> we're not in the habit of, um, um, closing down our windows and putting down the shutters and we couldn't understand why when we're driving through all these villages they all look like they're shut down and we think wow there's all these villages and they're all deserted well they're not all all deserted you know some of them actually they just put the shutters down to keep the houses cool because if, if the sun's going in it just bakes mm. uh, so we've we've started to do a bit of that ourselves so we do a lot of shading um, if I was to buy a place I would probably on a sunny wall grow some really good runner beans or something or something that um, is there in the summer and then not in the winter. That's a great idea. A really nice green canopy of fresh edible things or something really pretty and that smells nice to give yourself some extra cool. And then I'd get rid of it in the winter and then just have the lovely view. Because uh, that's the thing. You come out here for the lovely views. You don't want to shut your window, do you? Right. Yeah. It swings and roundabouts. You've got to learn how to manage your heat. Um, okay. So then one more question about the temperature and we'll move on. Do you have radiators? Do you have built-in air cons? Like, what do you do for the heat and the cool? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, a lot of a lot of Airbnbs have the built-in air conditioners, and they work really well. And I think they're quite um, cost-effective to run. Um, however, they cost quite a bit to buy initially. We have little plug-in heaters because we just want to sort of heat the room that we're using at the time. We've also had like wood burners and they're really great, but then you have to learn how to distribute the heat around the house. Mm. We've lived in a house, and this is, I think, something that a lot of Portuguese people are doing now, is they have boilers at the back of their wood burners. So they have wood burners and some kind of heat conversion. I just don't know what it's called. I'm not technical. So if you have anyone that's technical, you have to work that one out for yourself. But they they um, convert the heat from the fire to a boiler 
and then off to a radiator system. Huh. And that works well. And the wood here is cheap. It's cheap to buy. Okay. So that's an option. And it's really expensive. Like you, you could, we got um, a really big bill for electricity of something like 400 euros one month. Wow. One year. And that's, that's when you start saying, okay, I, I now know why a lot of Portuguese people don't put on their heating in the winter and they sit under duvets with about like their dressing gown or, <laughs> hot water. you know, it's cold. Yeah. It's cold and then it gets expensive. Yeah. All right. Okay, so that kind of segues us into the next question, which is talking about electricity bills, trying to run a bunch of different things at the same time. What is that like here? Um, well, uh, it's, it's interesting because we didn't realize how the electric bills work. Um, it took us a while. I mean, it's a bit like you sign up, decide which service you're signing up for, and you pay your bills. There's no problems there. But what I didn't realize was you can sign up to have um, a higher flow of electricity or not. And so there's like bands or graded bands. And when you go to an Airbnb, what we noticed was um, that, especially in the winter, if we put on the kettle and we were making something like putting something in a toaster or cooking something in the oven, and then we had the washing machine going because we've got three kids. Um, so the washing machine's always going. Then all of a sudden, the power would just trip out. <laughs> yeah. like, What's happened? Because this doesn't happen in the UK. We have power cuts, but we don't tend to like lose our electricity. And so first thing I'd recommend if you're staying in an Airbnb in Portugal is have a torch and learn when the electricity box is right from where I go. Because I'm pretty sure when I say that most people in who are running an Airbnb will be signed on to the lowest rate of energy. So if you're, if you're making too many demands on it, it will trip out. You can only use certain amounts of, of appliances. But if you want to have an electricity kind of flow that's higher that allows you to use more things at the same time, then you need to pay more per unit of electricity. So you need to sign up for a higher band. So if you're staying in a place or renting a place, the chances are it's signed up to the lowest bracket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what? you have to figure out uh, what works and what outlet and what can run. <laughs> We've been there. It's actually quite good because you start to realize how you're using your electricity. So you realize, okay, I must turn the kettle off and, you know, and so it's been interesting with Carl and I, because we both work on the internet, often doing live things. And so we don't use um, any kind of appliances when he's online. <laughs> okay, that ha it has happened. Um, so yeah, it, it makes you think differently. You're a lot more grateful for what you've got. But, yeah. yeah. Oh man, that's funny though, that yeah, when you're going live, of course you have to think, okay, don't turn the kettle on. <laughs> It's like that. I and mean, one thing we did was actually we got um, a thermos flask. So we made a lot of tea and just kept it in a, a flask. So we didn't have to do that. Uh, you, you do become more resourceful. Yeah, good future. little hacks to learn along the way, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. So for all the ladies out there and husbands who just need to be prepared about this, when you go to Portugal, what's the clothing like? What's the shopping scene? Talk to us about that. There's a lot more independent shops. Like when you're in smaller towns, you won't see so many big brands. And so you're not likely to get what you're used to wearing. And when I've been to local shops, what I found, even though I'm not particularly tall, I'm only sort of like mid height um, by English standards. When I buy clothes here, unless I buy them from an international outlet, like say H&M or similar uh, or United Colors of Benetton or something like that, then what I find is the, the sleeves are always too short. You know, like my arms are too long. <laughs> Everything's three quarters. <laughs> yeah, the, the trousers are just like skimming your ankles, but they don't really come down to where they should. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to, to learn. Um, like I've got average size feet in the UK, but over here my feet are slightly bigger. Um, and so when I think, oh, I'm just going to go in there and I'll be able to find a pair of shoes. Uh -uh. <laughs> you know, especially during the sales, you think, oh, sales on, I'll find something. You won't <laughs> <laughs> because you probably just a bit bigger. So what I would recommend um, if you want to go and buy some some good stuff is go to a forum. Um, mm. When we realized there were forums in Portugal, they're not particularly Portuguese because they are all brands. But um, in every major city, there's a forum, which is basically like a big mall. Um, and there you know exactly what you're going to get, how you're going to get it. It's open from, say, eight o'clock in the morning till midnight, I think, most of the time. And their shops really cater for children. Oh, okay. So there's play parks and little cars you can put your toddlers in and strap them in without them being able to escape <laughs> and, and the other thing um which I wish I'd known when I got here was um footwear 
it's different. I couldn't work out why people, um, well, you can tell tourists because, or people that don't live here because they often have fancy footwear, whereas Portuguese people tend to wear trainers mm. or look sneakers or very, very plain and very kind of flat shoes. And it's because the, the pavement here, which is called calçada, is really hard to walk on if you're not used to it. And it's fine in the summer when it's dry, but in the winter, it's really slippery. And when we're in, um, have you spent much time in Lisbon, Kaylee? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you pushed a push chair in Lisbon? No. So I actually haven't been there um, with the baby. We've been there before. So since we've moved here with COVID and everything, we haven't been down to Lisbon just yet because we were trying to go. We've actually had to reschedule a trip several times now. But so we were trying to go, um, but before when we used to visit here, we would go to Lisbon a lot, but that was pre stroller. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, when we first went out there, we had a, a five year old and a one and a half year old who was toddling. And so we wanted to put her in a push chair, but Lisbon's streets are like this. They've got loads of hills. And I had DM boots on like Dr. Martin boots, which you'd think you'd be able to walk in because they're really, they've got really good treads. Um, and so we had a, we had a stroller or we call them push chairs. And I, I just couldn't get up the hills. I mean, they were impossible. I had to get Carl to do them because my, my big DM boots were just slipping. Um, so I would say it's kind of inaccessible for people with strollers. It's much better to have them in a sling while mm -hmm. you can. It's, it's, it's not a very accessible city. I, I would say, like, if you're a wheelchair user or something like that, you want to go to somewhere like Belang, you know, like where it's really, really flat. Um, but, like, downtown Lisbon is, ooh. <laughs> right. So people wear trainers, I think. Yeah, and same in Porto. I mean, we get that in Porto as well. Uh, it's quite hilly here, and the the ground, like those little cobblestone things, are just very uneven, and they get very slick when it rains. I mean, I've noticed there are certain shoes I can't wear when it's at all wet outside because I will slide, and especially trying to push the stroller is hard. And when we go out, generally when we hit like an uphill, I let Josh push. <laughs> I'm like, okay, your turn. <laughs> you get and don't you don't you wonder how these old women do it? You know, like when they're pulling. I mean, you see it's more in the country, like where they're pushing wheelbarrows. But they Portuguese people seem to have a really good sense of balance, don't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. Then the tiles in the houses also are really slippery as well. So maybe they're just used to slippery surfaces. But it's hard. It right? is, yeah. So I think that maybe you have to go to more of a traditional place for shoes here because they'll get it right. They'll know what kind of style you actually need as opposed to if you go to a big like international chain, a big brand, and they have cute shoes, but they're not so functional here. So that's the issue. We found quite a few good places to buy homemade shoes, like oh. hand shoes. And so I've, I'm on my second pair of handmade boots and Carl's got some now um, and they're amazing. Really, yeah, really that's good. exactly what I wear, actually. I went to a little shop, um, and I have small feet, so I don't have as big of an issue with this because I'm just a short person. Um, but I found some really nice leather boots, and I've just been wearing them out all winter because they grip really well, and I really don't have any other shoes that grip. So I've just been wearing those all winter, but now it's starting to warm up, so I just switched to some of my flats, which are okay because it's not wet outside. <laughs> Yeah, it is a challenge. You have to think it through, don't you? Yeah, sure. definitely. And that's tough too because like when you move here, I mean, we don't like to move with a bunch of stuff. We'd rather just get the stuff when we get here. So we didn't bring any like big boots or those types of shoes with the big treads. So you, you have to find them here. I mean, they're here, but it can be kind of hard, especially the sizes, right? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay, so let's go ahead and shift a little bit. And uh, from one mom to another, let's talk about having kids here. So what's it like having kids in Portugal? And what are the people like with kids? Well, they're really cool. They really love them. And that's one of the pulls that we had for coming here was that we could go somewhere where people like kids, love kids, and accept that kids are a natural part of life. Like in the UK, um, if you went to a restaurant and your kid was making any kind of noise, people would be like, hmm what's going on and they kind of give you snotty looks and things whereas here it's almost encouraged you know the the people will just come and ruffle your kid's head as they walk past uh, there's a lot of um sort of patting of heads that goes on and lots of linda linda and i was thinking who's linda <laughs> I no idea what linda was um until i realized it means beautiful and of course we had a little um one and a half year old our daughter with us you know when we first moved and so everyone was rushing over they do a lot more of that with the girls than they do with boys that took a while to get used to, but it was really nice. You know, people aren't so worried about um, whether they touch other people's kids. It's just part of the culture. Mm. You know, they're very family orientated and 
you know, we, we, we have a babysitter here who's, who's Portuguese and she's got a huge family and it's nothing for her to just babysit her younger cousin or nephew or, you know, they're all together a lot of the time. And that's some of, something that really pulls us here because we felt that there's a much bigger sort of family sort of ethic, you know, people like mm. each other. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where it comes from. But with that also comes mass criticism from... <laughs> and things that think they know what's going on with your kid mm. uh, like we had a baby here and um our kids just like to be really naked I mean obviously they're wearing clothes now because our oldest is nine but um, <laughs> I hope <laughs> be frowned upon but um you know while they can be naked they just they just want to be and we we managed to get them in clothes so we can go out for a walk or go into town and stuff but they never look like they're fully dressed by Portuguese standards Portuguese kids have coats on in early autumn whereas for us my kids just want to be in t-shirts and shorts so um I don't know we've got a better tolerance for cold maybe um when we're outdoors and and culturally you do get stared at a little bit you know if your kids look uh, like they're cold and people come up and they'll touch your baby's feet and say oh frio frio oh they're cold they're cold and you have to say no no no, no. we're just English it's okay uh, <laughs> we're English <laughs> That's what we do say. We say, oh, no, 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 we're English. We're, you know, we, we like the cold, but we don't. But, you know, that's just, you have to be prepared for that. But one of the great things, um, I've, I've been, um, I, I've breastfed all my children um, and it's, it's, it's accepted here. And I was a bit worried about it because in the UK, sometimes it gets a, a bit of a negative response when mm. you're out and about, even though there's laws protecting you from doing that or, or having that kind of reaction. And so the first time I breastfed on this continent was as we were driving through Spain and I was thinking, oh, it's a Catholic country. And then I was worried about Portugal, but nobody, nobody bats an eyelid. It's, it's really not like anything to do with babies. They love you and accept you for it. If they can see you're looking after your child, that's all that counts. Yeah. You and you have to, you also have to know where your line is um, and be okay with being a mum. Mm. That's good advice. Yeah. At least you can still, like, if you're not fluent in the language, which I'm definitely not, you can um, at least sometimes say, ah, oh, I don't speak it in a kind of walk away, but in a, a sort of apologetic way. So you, you can use the sort of cross-cultural thing to be able to get out of the situation a bit easier. Okay, so let's shift a little bit and let's talk about cost of living, prices of things, because I think that a lot of people in their minds, they have an idea that Portugal is super cheap and a lot of people want to come here and think they're going to buy some amazing real estate for dirt cheap. So let's talk about the actual prices of things. I mean, that was one of the reasons we came over here. We, we're like economic migrants. We just wanted to be able to live a different life and we realized that we couldn't afford to do that in the UK but we thought we could do it here and we are <laughs> which is good but when we got here we had a bit of a shock um it's great that they've got Lidl and they've got Aldi and they've got some of the shops that we understand and so we were buying things from there and they'll sell a lot of international food and what I noticed was if you when you come over here if you're buying the same sorts of things that you would buy in the in your own country you're probably not going to realize much in the in the way of savings um, unless those things that you eat in your country are very similar to the Portuguese diet. So, for instance, um, you know, we might have seen like, you know, a type of cheese that they do in the UK. We might have wanted organic milk or, you know, you know, you're going through your shopping list. If you if you eat the same way as you do in your own country, you're unlikely to see the, the changes. But as we've got to see how Portuguese people live and the kinds of things they eat and where they eat and when they eat and stuff, we've realized that they're the things that are kind of discounted. Um, and so we will buy a certain amount of vegetables from the supermarkets, but we actually just go to a market like once a week and we'll buy a load of vegetables. And you can see what the Portuguese buy. Like um, we used to buy a lot of um, really sort of like nicely washed spinach and stuff. And yeah, it's a little bit more expensive, but when you go to the market, you'll get a big bag of it for next to nothing. And you have to give it a good wash, but it's, it's really good stuff. Like honey, for instance, seems a bit more expensive here. But if you're buying it from a supermarket, then you're missing a trick because for the same price, you can get natural honey that just hasn't been sort of altered in any way, shape or form from your local market. And you can buy a kilo of it for eight euros. And now we just think, well, that's a good price to pay. You know, like when you're going to restaurants or if you're going if you're going to a cafe, observe what the Portuguese are drinking. Like they'll have small little shots of coffee, which cost next to nothing. But if you want to go in there and get a big latte or, you know, something really 
you know, that you associate with your home, um, the chances are there's going to be a bit of a premium on it. So once we learned that a little bit, then our prices started to go down. Um, so for instance, we eat things with a lot more beans in now. Mm. Uh, so beans and cabbage and onion form a massive part of our diet. We have quite a lot of rice. Um, so we just changed the way we eat a little bit and the, the prices come down. There are some things that just seem more ex expensive when you first arrive. And I think part of it is that um, we might be used to getting all our shopping in one place. Mm. So for instance, I used to just go to one supermarket and buy pretty much everything I needed and it would have um, a pharmacy within it and I would just know where to go. And part of the problem is knowing where to go. Um, for instance, if you are into herbal things or stuff that you might get from um, a health food shop, you can find some of them here. They actually sell lots of herbs in supermarkets, like proper big packs of herbs for making special teas and things like that. But again, you have to kind of be like a Portuguese person and understand that. So if you're if you're wanting to drink nettle tea yourself and you buy a fancy packet of it that's ready made, then you might pay quite a bit more. But then if you go down the end of the aisle, you'll see that the Portuguese actually just buy it in a in a big loose pack and it costs next to nothing and it's organic. So yeah, it swings and roundabouts. The same with wine. You want to buy the Portuguese wine, not something that's imported or else you pay a big sure. Yeah. So the, I guess the best advice is just when you come here, observe what the Portuguese are doing and, and do as they do. Yeah, definitely. It's the same with restaurants as well. Like if you're trying to buy something a la carte, like if, if you're wanting them to create something for you, then you will pay more for it. But if you just look at what they're eating, you'll see that most people just have like some standard dish of the day. Um, and it nearly always comes with chips and rice and salad, which was really strange for us when we first arrived it was like whoa double carbs and a salad yeah <laughs> steady on there with the carbs mm -hmm. I actually come to enjoy it now and if we don't get our rice and our chips and our salad we're like oh we've been shortchanged but it's, it's worth <laughs> seeing what people do um and then as you start doing it their way and start buying from their shops like they will go to different shops to get different things like if you eat meat the butchers are much cheaper than than going to the supermarkets often and you you get a good cut they'll get to know you and and they'll help you out it's the same you know wherever you go just try and find out what the locals are doing okay and then you've moved around a little bit out of portugal so any advice for those looking for housing because i think that a lot of people think that housing here is super super cheap and Maybe if you're out in the country, it might, it's cheaper uh, as opposed to a city. But, I mean, we've seen housing prices for buying in Lisbon and Porto can be crazy. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's an interesting one because there's lots and lots of property for sale here. And there's lots more property that's not for sale. And the Portuguese are really, really rich in property. So much so that a lot of them can't even maintain the property that they've got. You know, they've inherited stuff. And also, there are a country of people that tend to go out, you know, their, their net migration, they're at a loss, you know, more people are leaving Portugal than more people, than people are coming in. So I think they're quite grateful for having um, people wanting to come here, because, you know, you need people to have a an economy, don't you? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all these houses that might have been left and the um, people are due to inherit them might be, one of them might be in South Africa, another in Canada, <laughs> another in France. And so it makes buying a property a little bit difficult if there's, a, you know, a shared inheritance involved. So you want to be careful with that. But what I've noticed is a lot of the cheaper ones, they will be in the middle of nowhere and they will be in quite a bad state of repair. And if, if you've got the skills and the time and the know-how of how to rebuild a place, then it's great. But and, and we did have the dream of buying, you know, a place that we could, you know, bring back to life and love it and all that. You know, it was a real sort of like dream, you know, <laughs> it was obviously a dream because it's not a reality. Um, and the, the fact is, we've got children and we're both building our businesses and you just don't have time to do your houses. So I think if you're coming over that dream, you need to know that you've got a the money to be able to do it. Because there's nothing worse than being in a Portuguese house that needs heating in the winter. And you can't afford it. <laughs> we did spend quite a few months with no hot water. Um, one. <gasps> what? <laughs> we were boiling water with a kettle. On a... So we've experienced all levels of um, habitation since we've been here. And it's through, you know, we're not victims of it. You know, we were we had an exciting project that we were getting involved in. And it was a little bit more, well, it's a lot more than we could deal with. It, you know, it was way too much for us. And, you know, it, it's important to know that. And there's so many expats that come over and they buy a place that they don't have the time or resources to do. So mm. What I would recommend is is look for 
a house sitting or um, do some volunteering on a farm or something and move around Portugal, you know, spend some time. If you don't have kids um, and you, you're a remote worker, then it's, it's perfect because you can find digs somewhere for a reduced amount of money and you get a chance to spend time looking around. There's some really great places that we've seen. We love Queenborough. I haven't been to Porto. I think I'd like that. Tamar is beautiful and amazing. We really like the triangle between Queenborough, Tamar and Fundau. Um, sort of really central so you've got some really beautiful views and hills and things when you're driving so I think come out and experience it and speak to somebody that can guide you through the process and spend some time speaking to other expats um, and, and then make your decision when you're out here. Okay so on this list uh, that you think that Carl missed you talked about the Festus so what yeah. are they good and bad tell us. They're amazing. The festas are so good. And we've lived, I mean, we've lived in some great places. And um, in the evening, sometimes you'll hear music starting up at about 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, I might be putting my kids down to bed. I mean, hopefully by then they'll sleep. But <laughs> you hear this kind of music and you think, oh, someone's having a house party down the road. You hear this kind of boom, boom, boom. And then you expect it to stop and it doesn't and it goes on for a bit. And then you realize it's festa season. Um, and that's the thing to be aware of. Um, from maybe May until maybe late July, maybe even August, each town or village has its own little festas um, or festas. <laughs> and then they all get together and they, they put up, you, you'll notice if you drive through Portugal that they erect these stages all of a sudden, there's bunting, you know, like streamers in the street and lights and the whole community comes together for maybe one night or it might be three. In bigger places, they'll, they'll have proper DJs and proper sets. Um, but it's a really good place to go and try local food um, and local wine. A lot of the locals will bring their own dishes and, and share them out and stuff. Anadia, where we're currently living near, they have a five-day festival. And it's incredible. Like They have um, loads of bands over a five days. It's almost like a music festival. So, you know, you just get a load of different places to go to. I'd absolutely check it out because you get to see how Portuguese people live and socialize and stuff. Uh, it's great. But it's noisy. Yeah, it is noisy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is noisy. Um, and they start late. They tend to, especially some of the local ones, like the Anadia one starts at seven or eight at night and it might go maybe to one o'clock in the morning. Um, I might be wrong on that, but roughly. Um, but some of these local ones, they might go on till two or three in the morning sometimes even later but you know it's they're just for the local environment you know and sort of everyone's in agreement so they just have have this kind of street party almost yeah it's um, good to be aware of though that that you know that could happen where you're yeah, living if that's if that's a problem for you mm. um yeah then you might need to i don't know um invest know, in earplugs <laughs> hot bath earplugs a bit of lavender essential oil <laughs> better to participate them if you can and then you'll enjoy them that's good advice join them yeah <laughs> okay so you were talking about earlier you've got some pets you have chickens um tell us about pets in portugal strays in portugal what do you know about that uh we have quite a big experience with strays we were house sitting in central portugal and um this there was a hell of a commotion outside our house one night like a dog was being attacked and, and we looked out the window, couldn't see anything. The next day we saw this little, this little um, terrier um, covered in blood <gasps> underneath a rose bush. And so we kind of got her out and cleaned her up and um, gave her some food and she just stayed. <laughs> <laughs> we went around the, um, the local area we were living in and um, tried to find her owner. Um, but, and, and we would walk her out and then we'd walk away to see if she came back or to see if she went off to where she really lived. And she just kept coming back. And so in the end, we took her to the vets to see if she had a chip. And she had a French chip. So she was a French dog um, who had, I don't know, she'd been dumped. There's a lot of French visitors come to central Portugal in the middle of summer because there's a lot of French and Portuguese connections in central Portugal. And so often around those places, all of a sudden during the summer, there's loads of French cars everywhere and people having picnics at the same time. It's very cultural. Um, so I, I think she was an abandoned dog. And so we adopted her. Um, little did we know that she was already pregnant. Um, <laughs> she had um, she had emergency surgery and she lost all her puppies, unfortunately. Aww. 
Um, but at the same time in this house where we're living at, it, it must be like there's this beacon that goes out to the animal community that there's some animal loving expats have moved in. Um, this, this, <laughs> this mama cat arrived at our at the house we were house sitting and she came with three little kittens. That was within a week of us arriving and just before our dog arrived. Th this mum just dropped her kittens off and then just left. And so there's these three little defenseless kittens dropped off at our house by this kind of wise mama cat. And so we started feeding these kittens and looking after them. We couldn't get close to them because they were feral, but we were hoping one day we'd be able to get close enough to them that we would be able to take them to the vets to ensure that there's not another generation. Um, <laughs> In that time, I had a child, uh, another child, and we just didn't manage to tame the kittens enough. Um, and one of them disappeared and two of them got pregnant. And so we adopted also the kittens of the kittens. <laughs> oh, gosh. And one of the mama cats that we managed to look after. So at one point, we had five, five cats. There's so many um, animals here. I mean, this is a, a place that's animal rich. And um, like in the UK, we all lock our dogs up and they're inside our houses mostly. And then we take them out for a walk and then they come back into our house. Um, but over here, a lot of people just have um, outdoor kennels. Mm. Dogs are outside barking all night often. You know, someone comes up the road, one dog starts and then the other and then the other. And then it's like a big bark fest. The barking band, like you yeah. say. You don't need to go and look for an animal to adopt is probably the advice I'd give. If you come out here with the ideas of having animals, they will come to you. They will find you very quickly. Expats accumulate animals very quickly. And the chickens are just a delight. If you've got so <laughs> chickens, they're so easy to look after and we get fresh eggs every day. Um, That's a nice perk. <laughs> really lovely. Um, in fact, we're living in a small farm um, and our landlady has also adopted two sheep. Um, and one gave birth. So we've got a little lamb, two sheep, chickens. Look out this window and there's vineyards just outside. It's, it's beautiful. And we can walk into town as well. If there wasn't a lockdown in place, we could just walk into town. So. Yeah. So that's good for the animal lovers. And actually, uh, we have a dog. I, our viewers know that, that we brought with us that we adopted when we lived in South Korea. We actually just recently put out a course for Americans to get the D7 visa, and we started at a special launch price, and then we decided after a certain amount we were going to move it up to a price, but we wanted to have some of the proceeds go to a local charity around here in Porto. And I love animals, so we found a, an association, they're called Metis, that is in the Porto area, and they actually uh, help with a lot, like the strays and everything, because even though we're in a city, I would say you don't see as many strays strays as you would if you're out in the country. Um, there are some pockets of them though and we've had friends who have seen more depending on where they are but this company or this organization is really good because they also help sterilize the animals because like you said they just keep having kittens or puppies and and that's really hard then to control it and contain it right so they help with with that so we we started donating to them. A lot of people ask us about animals in in Portugal. So it's a big thing. Uh, I think that's really good. And it's amazing that you're able to do that. Um, I, I think if you do look after strays, when you go to a vet, there are some vets out there that will help you if you're helping the strays. You know, they'll give you a discount and you know, they're, they're kind of mindful of it. Um, Which is great because I think that, yeah, I mean, they can see that it, it can be a problem and at least we're trying to help, right? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, and I think that's a really good thing. I think if you are living in another country, you should do what you can to help the local mm -hmm. area. You should sort of add to it rather than detract. Okay, so moving away from the chickens and the dogs and kittens and everything, um, why don't you go ahead and tell us some pros and cons of living in Portugal, moving to Portugal, just the expat life in Portugal. The COVID thing has is, is, is kind of detracted. We could just very well be in the UK right now um, although we've got better views and we've got more animals but I'm sure once um, all the restrictions get lifted fully um, we'll go back to living how we do and, and the way we do it is we're able to both of us work for a few hours a day each each of us is like juggling the kids around but then in the afternoons we're able to chuck everyone in the car pack up some things to go to a river beach or go to you know the main beach or go to wherever we want actually um, so what we tend to do is just go on little adventures every day. And it's so easy to go somewhere else, you know, because everything is so nearby and there's, 
the Portuguese are really, really understated about their country. They don't really market it that well. You know, there's little treasures everywhere. And so our real lifestyle is is about doing as little work as we can, just enough so that we can enjoy ourselves. But we've got the time to go out and hang out as a family and enjoy the, the nature and stuff. And because it's cultural that children go to bed quite late here, it's not unusual if a family's out at sort of eight or nine walking the streets and having a coffee here, grabbing an ice cream there and, and just wandering around. It's, it's just a wonderful place where you, we get a sense of freedom. Mm. Um, and I, I know for this sort of equivalent lifestyle in the UK, we, we just couldn't, we couldn't both of us work part time and have a, a nice place to live and be able to afford to go out with our children and eat in restaurants whenever we want. And, you know, it, it is a sacrifice you know, we haven't got a big house and, you know, all these great things yet. Um, I know it's coming, but it's it's a bit of a sacrifice when you move from one country to another, like permanently. But it just offers us the chance to have some freedom and to do things slightly differently. That's so amazing. Yeah. yeah, for economic migrants, but it's suiting us. Our kids are so relaxed as well, you know. So I, I think the big the big advantage for us is this living here reminds me of growing up in England, say 30 years ago, where there was a bigger sense of community and where people did things for each other. Mm. And I know that if we were still in the UK now, we would both need to work really, really full times, so like sort of extra, you know, putting loads of extra hours. We'd both need to do that to be able to afford to pay for our house and and everything would be such a juggle. And I think that's why people aren't so connected to each other anymore because they're in such a rat race to be able to afford the lives they've got that it's painful. And yet there's all these pleasurable options that you can do around the world. I mean, I've lived in a few places, but this is, this is the one right now for us. And awesome. Yeah. That's I mean, great. Same for you guys, isn't it? Yeah. Not yeah, that. definitely. We at Expats Everywhere believe that living abroad transforms lives. And you've kind of touched on it a little bit with Portugal specifically, but you have lived all over the place. So if you could just tell us in a couple sentences, how do you believe that living abroad has transformed your life? It's opened my eyes to things. It's opened my eyes to new food, smells, tastes, languages. I guess what it means to me is that you don't have to live life in the way that your culture prescribes it. So um, the moment you step outside of where you grew up, all of a sudden, all bets are off. You don't have to do like you don't have to do the same things. You don't have to feel the same pressures. Um, it, it offers you a new perspective, and it's like that perspective is so much broader. I spent um, nine months in Bali, which I loved. Um, it was amazing, hearing the sounds of people chanting and the different sounds of the instruments and the different tastes. Um, was amazing and being on a moped all the time which I'm sure you guys did when you were in Southeast Asia <laughs> on a moped going up to a, a volcano you know those kinds of experiences you don't have in your home countries necessarily right. um, I lived in France for five years lived in Italy for a bit and yeah the lifestyles they they're all just different they all have their unique stamps and none of them are particularly better than the other I think some of them are the places that you need to be in at that particular time you know, so like Bali suited me when I was single, probably wouldn't have been the place for me to raise my family. But Portugal's perfect for that. Um, you know, yeah. it's all swing roundabouts, but it's great. Yeah, I, I advise people just to travel. Um, it's an opportunity. Yeah, that's great. If you're new to the channel and you're interested in moving to Portugal on a D7 visa, then look no further. You have everything you need right here in this playlist. And if you missed Carl's interview, Louisa's husband, then you want to click right here to check that out. Now let's get moving. All right, well, Louisa, thanks for filling in all those little gaps that Carl left out. <laughs> left out much, didn't he? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thanks for having me.